Good evening all. Thanks very much for coming. Tonight we welcome Holly Angioni and Bill Zolik, who have been wonderful members to our uh, assets to our community of Goldsboro for many years now. They are volunteers for the town of Goldsboro and they will tell us about the ongoing programs to protect Goldsboro's working waterfront and many acres of clam habitat and <clears throat> the, how climate change is going to affect all of us and presents a severe challenge to the Goldsboro shores. Go on, Pauline. Thank you very much for coming. I think as we go through the presentation, it sounds like a funny combination, clams and climate change, but actually they're incredibly related, as we discovered once we got going. So um, we're going to split the presentation tonight. I'm going to talk a little about the historical aspects of clamming here, and then Bill's going to talk about some of the things that he's discovered as he's working with the clams and the climate change stuff. So these are some clamors from around 1900. Um, mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Our work was supported, we always have to say that, by no, grants from NOAA and the Maine Coastal Program. I'm supposed to be sitting down tonight. <coughs> so this is actually one of Bill's last slides, but I stole it and put it up here first also, because I liked what it said. Goolsboro's connection to the Gulf of Maine shaped its history and will shape its future. And that's kind of what we're talking about tonight, how the two pieces fit together. So I'm going to talk about the history of clams. He's going to talk about what's happening with the shellfish lab, about shore access today, and climate change. So this was my first introduction to clams. <laughs> On bad Friday afternoons in college, I had a friend who had a car. And we would go to Howard Johnson's and meet fried clams. <laughs> I was horrified when I saw, this is a 1964 menu, tender sweet clams in a toasted roll with tartar sauce were 75 cents. Oh if you wanted french fries, potatoes, and coleslaw with that, it was a dollar ten. Wow. Oh. Oh. Beef was a yeah, yeah well, I, I grew up around fresh water, you know. And so, next slide. So, I wondered if we could know a little bit about your association with clams. Like, do any of you have clamors in your family, or have you ever clammed, or anybody have any clam connection? Yeah, Kakini Island in Westport, Long Island Sound. Aha, uh -huh. so Baja? Great, uh, my great uncles and my father, I clammed. Cool, cool. Anybody else? We all uh, did recreationally. Yeah? Well, my father was a clam digger and cutler. Cutler? Whoa, a lot of clam flats and cuts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Neat. You know, my father uh, dug in Goodwill here during the war. Yeah. And, and during the Depression. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yep. We'll talk about that some more. Neat. Okay. Next one. So we are talking about soft shell clam, clams, as I call them, crabs. Soft shell clams, not claw hogs, not hard shell ones. And they do have some particular requirements that that make them special and a little difficult, as you'll hear later, a little difficult to raise. Next one. So there's a very long history of clams around here, and we know that uh, Professor Newcomb, Newsom, when she spoke in June about the, the shell middens, a lot of those shell middens are clam shells, clam and mussel shells. Um, and it's, it's not just generalized Maine. The name for the bar, after which Bar Harbor is named the bar, the bar Island, in Abenaki, which I didn't even try to write down because there's no way I can pronounce it, means the place to dig clams. Because mm -hmm. that's, the Indians used to camp there on the shore in Bar Harbor in the summers and dig clams. They set up their teepees and their tents and traded with the rusticators, but it was a huge big clamming area then. Um, there's, I couldn't find a number that everybody agreed on, but supposedly there are between 1,700 and 2,000 shell middens in Maine. Some of them have been dug up and used for industrial purposes, but some of them are still there, and they generally tend to not be on maps, so you won't know where they are, so you can't go dig them up. Um, access to the shore is very interesting in Maine, too. We're going to talk, Bill will talk a little later about what some of the access problems now are. But it turns out that um, as part of the United States being a British possession, the king owned down to the high tide line. 
which left below that accessible through clamors and other harvesters. The Massachusetts Bay Colony changed that and gave everyone permission to build or to own land down to the low tide line because they wanted them to build wharves and increase the commerce all along the shoreline. So that was cool except for the harvesters because then they couldn't get into that intertidal zone. So actually just the, the fact that there was um, a cutting off of access to the, to the low tide encouraged a lot of the Wabanaki to fight with George Washington to get rid of, <laughs> rid of these guys. Uh, once Maine became a state, they changed it within a year. They put it back to being the low tide but with access for fishing, fowling, and navigation. So if you want to fish, you want to shoot birds, or you need to navigate, you have access to that shore. Um, and they also made control of that space, they put it under the jurisdiction of the local towns, which is still true today. But anyway. All of our diggers need a license, both a state license and a local license. And preference is given to local residents in getting licenses. The licenses don't become available to non-residents of the town until after the first month, I think, the, yeah. the local harvesters have access to the licenses. If there are any left over, they can be sold to non-residents. So uh, this is another quote that I found that I thought was quite wonderful. Clam flats are arguably the closest nature has come to providing a year-round free lunchroom in a temperate climate. But armed with a pea pod, a rake, and a subtle back, a man could feed and satisfy the necessities and not the desires of a large family. Um, and during the Civil War, they said clams sustained many households that, that were fatherless because the men were off fighting the war. Or as, as you had mentioned, in, in hard times, it would, it's free food. It's free, good protein. So where do you have mud flats? Or where do you have clams? Where you have mud and when you have, where you have a, a clam colony that's working it. The blue, these blue things are where the clam flats in Gouldsboro are. I chopped off the bottom of the peninsula because that's Winter Harbor and they've got sheer shores so they don't have mud flats. They've got rocks. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we're going to come back to this picture in a little bit, but this is up around Tap Point. This is South Coast Road, just to get everybody oriented. This is Korea, and that's Goldsboro Point. And this is Birch Harbor and Prospect Harbor. Um, as we've been saying, they're an important source of food. They were also used for bait, and they could be canned. So they were, they could be, the Indians dried them and smoked them. Um, there were several canneries. This one is from Scarborough. It was run by Burnham and Morrill, the baked bean people. Um, next one. And this is the Lowell factory in, or no, Underwood, I'm sorry, in um, Bass Harbor. It's now a big condominiumized building. Um, but these folks said, no, we used to get go clamming with Dad, and then we'd get, prep them and take them over to Underwood's camp. Um, this is a quick look at their impact on the economy. Clams are the second. <coughs> It's ranking contributor. The flip's between second and third with elders. And with elders now, yeah. yeah. Um, so after lobsters, and there's a big jump between lobsters and anything else, but it's, it has been clams, but we're not competing with elders in terms of, uh, so the red line's the weight, and the top line's the total value. And you can see it as highs and lows, and it's been low lately. Um, the price, the average price per pound also tends to scoot all around. Um, even on a week-to-week -week basis here, if the price goes up, there's less demand, so then the buyers won't buy, so the diggers don't buy. And similarly, the number of harvesters tends to follow along with the, with the availability of clams. The Department of Marine Resources assesses areas where there are clam flats and sets limits to the amount that can be harvested. Um, it also, and I hadn't realized this at all before, Maine provides 62% of the shellfish landing, or the soft shell landings in the United States. Um, and it's the leading state with 1.6 million pounds of, of clam meat, not, the other, the other weights were clams with shellfish, they were much heavier. 
Um, how do you pick them? By law, you have to pick them by hand. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a worm rake, or it looks very much like a, a clam rake back there, and you saw the clam rakes that the fellows in the videos were using. But you have to either use a rake like that or, or do it with your hands, which is called pulling. And it's hard work. We had a bunch of the shellfish harvesters and the shellfish warden uh, got together with us, and we had a little public presentation last summer in Prospect Harbor out behind Dorcas, and people were amazed at how hard work it is. <laughs> and for me, I say just standing up is sometimes impossible. Uh, so they have either wooden hods or wicker baskets, and again in the video, one gentleman had an all wooden roller. They're called rollers because they were actually built with a round bottom because it's easier to slosh them off if you can tip in the bucket. He just used to, he's told me he hitches his rollers to his kayak by the time he paddles back to where he's going, they're all pretty clean. <laughs> Very efficient. <laughs> right. Um, they use different things, and I hadn't realized, I knew they used baskets and bushel baskets and stuff, but they actually use big onion bags. They're lightweight, they're strong, you load them up, and they're 30 <coughs> to 60 pounds a piece. Um, and the mosquitoes and the green-headed flies and the gnats and everything, that hasn't changed either. But otherwise, it has, the whole process hasn't changed. So here's some guys with their baskets. Looks like they're pulling out to see. It looks like a rake in there. Anybody know Donald Anderson? This is a Korea guy. Okay. Do you have any idea when this picture's from? <laughs> mm, quite young. Look, look, way back before you had his hardware store in Korea. But he had oh. but he had oh. he had a factory down there that he bought. Oh, this is from the Woodboro Storm Museum website. I think, I'm not certain about this, but I think that's a Louise Young photograph, uh, which means it would be a little bit later than the 40s. It would be more like the 50s, early 50s. I looked, but there wasn't, doesn't yeah. seem to be any identifying information on this, the photograph. Right. I'm pretty sure Joe has that had that photo in his assortment of stuff. And again, the diggers, they think, don't look this, that different. You know, we've got a metal one. We've got a fellow who's a little older, a guy who's a little younger. Um, they were both really raking clams. This is over in Jones Cove one summer afternoon. If I may just add a comment. You'll notice that they're digging in pretty hard packs. And one of the effects of the green crabs has been that um, if it's softer mud, the green crabs have an easier time getting out the clams. And so the, uh, it turns out that you can find more live clams up where it's harder. Higher? Yeah, mm -hmm. higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we haven't said anything about green crabs yet, but yeah. we're coming to that. Yeah. So challenges for the diggers themselves is the shore access, and you're going to talk some more about shore access, right? Hello. Why it's getting to be Hello. more difficult. Yeah. Um, it's tide dependent. You can only dig when the tide is out, um, and sometimes low tides in the middle of the night. Um, it's obviously rather backbreaking work. The reason all, so many people in Maine have back trouble. Um, they're difficult to transport once you're out of the water, and this becomes a really major issue. Uh, you can get these 60 pound bags, and if you have to park a quarter of a mile away, that's a long haul to get back. Uh, through mud. <laughs> through mud, well, in any, any place. Um, winds and tide become an issue. I was talking to one clammer, and he was talking about clamming over in South Goldsboro and taking a canoe up to Taft Point. You take your life in your hands <laughs> between the tides and the winds, and there's places you can get to and places you just can't get to. And we actually did lose one of the harvesters a couple years ago. Uh, he was out clamming and they were in the canoe and it tipped over and we lost him. So, um, and the weather, besides being out digging in the rain, if you get more than two inches of rain in 24 hours, the clams can't dig. Uh, DMR closes the flaps. They're afraid of pollution and runoff. So you just can't dig. So, um, and sometimes the flats freeze, not so much recently, but that has happened. And this is a wonderful letter that I found over at the MDI Historical Society. It was a letter to the Overseers of the Poor in 1868, in the end of March. It said, sir, I want you to send me a little bread, if possible, or I don't know what 
to do. I don't want to go to any other town, nor do I want to suffer too much. There is nothing around here that I can get everybody is without. It is the hardest times that ever I see. The ice bars us from the flats. Can't get anything. And I'm lame and sick. If I could get a little help with the present after spring opens, I could help myself. If nothing happened more than I know, I want a little flower and some meal or peace pork. I am so lame, I can't come over. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty strict. You just need some help for the flam flats are broken. Mm -hmm. So we're back to the shore access, the same map we had before. But if we look at this in terms of access, so the bright greeny spots are where the clam flats are. The red spots are where there's official town harbors. So this is South Foolsboro. This is the little, um, yeah, the, the landing, the landing in um, on Goolsboro Point. This is Prospect Harbor, where there's now an uh, access path, and this is the Sharp. Well, the other end. That's the that's the town pier. Okay. Do you notice any um, <laughs> access points here? All this has to be done with arrangements with the people who own that land. And more and more of it is built on um, or built on and used as rental property. The white dots are town, we went through all the town owned property to see if there was other places where we could provide access on property that already belonged to the town. But unfortunately those spots end up not helping much. And then there's challenges for the clan. Um, overfishing, it's really easy to kill a clam flat if you overfish it, which is another reason you don't want people from outside of town coming, because they come down and spend three or four days and haul as much as they can. Um, ocean acidification is hard on the shells, and soft shell clams have enough trouble keeping their shells closed in the first place. They need to be in mud in order to keep those shells closed. It's like us in resistance exercise. They need the mud pushing against them to stimulate it to produce it. And then the predators, the warmer waters bringing more predators, and the green crabs we mentioned earlier are one of those. Um, starfish also play, prey on clam and milky ribbon worms. And I just thought this was a delightful diagram of how a milky, milky ribbon worm just goes right up the siphon of the clam and eats it. They have a very long proboscis tongue that they just can drive through any small hole and they inject sal saliva into the shell, dissolve the clam, and then just suck it up. Uh, really, boy, that's a monster from the deep. Clam. <laughs> what do we got next? We got you. Yeah. Yes, okay. Certain season for clamming? Um, it's, it's year round. Year round. Yeah, it's year round. The different parts, the, the Goldsboro has a very active shellfish committee. Um, the shellfish committee makes decisions about what will be open when. Mm. Um, there are places, for instance, Prospect Harbor, now that's open. Oh, Prospect Harbor was closed for more than 30 years because of uh, fecal pollution. We managed to get it open as people finally cleaned up their septic wow. system and whatnot. Now it'll be open this coming year, and um, it's it's a place that is pretty good for winter digging because you're protected from the north. Oh. So that's the kind of thing where they think about, okay, we won't use this in the summer, we'll save it for winter because it's, it's a good place, you're out of the wind. Um, so, uh, but it's year-round. Um, we do have... Uh, harvesters who that is their primary source of income and so you know they dig all year mm -hmm. uh, others dig it seasonally when other things aren't fishable and not not all the flats are open at the same time right. there's a whole schedule uh, which is decided uh -huh. by the shellfish committee mm -hmm. and approved by the board of selectmen <clears throat> so they have different places that they fish and again it's weather dependent or they're letting it rest to let the the population rebound. That's actually a good segue. I, uh, I kind of, you handed me a good, good way into this. So the reason I got in, interested in it, I'm, I'm by training, I'm an educator, and I work with kids, and I work later in life mostly with teachers who wanted to work with kids and get them doing things that, that mattered to the town. And one of the unique things about clams, there's a couple of other um, 
KOIs or another, but they're actually managed by the community. So much that we do is managed by the state. And so as a town, we don't have any really direct decision making on what, on the bed. But for clams, you do. And so this thing that Pauline had mentioned about local control, make clams uh, and shellfish in general a really special kind of thing insofar as they are managed by the town. And there are about 70 towns that have chosen to create ordinances to manage their shellfish. Winter Harbor isn't one of them, but as Pauline said, it's, it's not, not, not a lot of climbing there. But, but Goldsboro is a, act, has an active committee, and, and I, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But, so, anyways, this picture is uh, a picture of actually high school students and then the shellfish warden, uh, Mike Kinkham, um, pulling a net off of the mud flat in the fall because that is one of the ways that, that the Shellfish Committee has chosen to bring class, the class that have been, essentially it seems like they're dead mud because green crabs have cleaned them out. And they basically reseed the flats and then cover the nets with mud so that the, so that the, uh, clam, uh, the crabs can grow, <coughs> the clams can grow to uh, enough size where they can dig deep enough and there's not a lot of incentive for the crabs to, to dig real deep. Um, so, so anyway, so that's a strategy that began to, Goolsboro began doing this around 2014, 2015. And um, in addition to having um, kids help with the hard, heavy work, it became an opportunity to get kids involved in um, trying to figure out where it is that they should do the seeding. So collecting data about the predation about the growth rates in different places so that the shellfish community can make decisions about well, where we're going to invest all of this effort in terms of restoring plant flats. Okay, next slide. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Like we could have a whole presentation about the shellfish lab, but I, I really want to talk about a bunch of things to, tonight. So the having wanting to be able to seed flats with plants led to, well, gee, we would like to have more juvenile clams to do seeding with. And they're expensive if you buy them at one year old. Makes sense. Somebody's got to raise them for a year. And so um, Mike Pinkham, the shellfish warden, and I came up with uh, the idea of, well, why don't we try growing them our ourselves? And this is uh, Dana Rice's uh, lobster uh, dealer place. And this is the nice view down Bunkers Harbor from that. And so this became the home of a, a kind of an experimental shellfish lab. If you go to the next slide. Um, the goals were to see if we could actually produce a whole lot of juvenile clams at less expense if we did it ourselves. And also um, the reason that we got funding, I mean, that wasn't enough of a good enough thing. The reason we got funding is, is that we keep careful records and that we share everything with other communities. So what we learn here in Goolsboro uh, gets shared at the Maine Fishermen's Forum and on our Goolsboro Shore website and all sorts of places with other folks, communities that might be interested in doing that. This picture you see is uh, of one of our tanks. It's, the buckets are uh, cut out in the bottom. There's netting, very fine mesh in the bottom. The water runs up through the bucket. The, the water's pumped in from the harbor runs up through the bucket and then runs out this manifold back out to the harbor. So it runs up, each of these buckets has got thousands of juvenile clams in it. So that's how the clams can be fed and, and grown um, within the shellfish lab. This is Mike, that's Governor Mills who paid us a visit uh, last summer? Yeah, 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 last summer, yeah. Anyway, um, anyway. so next slide. Um, as I said, we, we can do, I have done oh, long presentations about data and stuff in the shellfish lab. I guess the, for this, I'm wanting to make the point that this is something that the shellfish committee is involved in. This is uh, something where you have um, the harvesters and volunteers like Pauline and me and Vicki Bay and many others actually, uh, involved in trying to see whether or not we can figure out how to recreate a little bit of balance on the mud flats so that, uh, so that the clams have got a chance. This here was, and the, one of the things we learned is location matters. 
So these are about four foot by four foot trees that are in mesh in the bottom. They each started out holding about 10,000 juvenile plants. And I say juvenile plants, they start out maybe a quarter of an inch or so. And our goal is to grow them out to about a half or three quarters of an inch, which works tremendously in other places. And we've done it for, I think, three years now at Hillsborough. And we get hammered every year. Uh, we have survival rates of, of less than 30% because the green crabs, despite the fact that everything is sealed up, they settle into the trays when they are less than a millimeter large, long, and they grow like crazy. It's unbelievable. They settle in in the summer, and by the time we open up the trays, we have green crabs that are have a carapace width of an inch. Well, they don't have to move. They're surrounded by food. <laughs> that's quite a good deal. But they don't have other clams that eat each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, one of the things we learned is that, and I, and I think this is a bigger loss. I'll be talking at Squid Institute in a couple weeks. And one of the things is making generalizations about coastal stuff is really, really difficult. Every place is a little different because life comes in and out. And one of the things that we're learning is, is that we really need to be very specific about what happens where rather than talking about this, this works and it should work everywhere. Um, the whole bunch of stories we have about different pumps and what did they work now. We've got it settled now and we now have a, what actually turned out to be a uh, a swimming pool pump that we're using, and it, it is able to pump much more water, and amazingly, it's, it's, we're getting about, I would say, five to eight times the water flow, and we, it costs a third the electricity of the pump that we used last year. So, you know, we're learning, and that's stuff that is worth sharing to everybody. I'll talk a little bit about this since um, Pauline mentioned it. Um, COVID as most of you know, really caused a kind of a real estate event uh, here. And um, one of the effects of that is, is that there was an incentive for people who were living on the shore to sell their property. And many of the, as uh, Pauline said, the various agreements that make it possible for people to get up have developed over sometimes generations, but certainly over years. Some of them are individual climbers know something and they don't share it with the other climbers because they, they get to that property. But a lot of them are sort of shared in common. One of the things, um, I'll talk a little bit about the various funding that we've gotten, but we've used some of the funding to actually get on top of this issue. And uh, Pauline and Vicki Ray, and with help from Bob DeForest from English Service Trust, sat down for a few meetings with the sulfur harvesters and got them to open up about where it is that they go. And it didn't, <laughs> they weren't, it didn't, they didn't talk a whole lot at first. But what was interesting is once they got talking, just volumes of information came out about what this, which site was good for what, what seasons, whether the wind was blowing a certain way, you can't go in there and all that, and just, you know, wow. Uh, and then a, a couple of climbers took Vicki and Pauline out to various sites and walked them through and explained all of this to them. What, what came out of that, was a pretty detailed mapping of places that we needed to try to, to protect if we could. Um, and part of that is just getting in touch with people who move in and buy property and letting them know that um, the town is getting more active in terms of making it easier for a property owner to, to do this. Um, but also it's partly um, sometimes having to buy something uh, or having talking someone into to actually making a gift of land for access. And we've actually had a couple of those things happen. So we're doing better than I thought we would in terms of actually making sure that critically important access points are, are protected. Um, it's ongoing work. Um, I'll, I'll get that in a minute. Anyway, I want to get to the other thing that came away from this, all of this. So I've been doing this with the Shellfish Committee for now almost seven years. And um, what was true in terms of predation and water temperature on the flats when I started is no longer true. It is much, water is much warmer now than it was five, six years ago. So, uh, next slide. So, what emerged from this is, is that, you know, it's not just about 
plans. So this was, as many of you know or remember, on June 9th of 2021, this is when we had a, a major rain event. Our backyard, we live in Prospect Harbor on the shore. We have a, a good high quality rain gauge and we got over six inches of rain in an hour. And what happens is we live on a, we all live on peninsulas that are relatively small and there's high spots in the middle and they're kind of steep. And you get all that rain dropping on and it runs off really, really fast and with enormous force. So next slide. Um, before that happened, uh, Mike and I and others got to talking with the town and sort of saying, you know, we really like to try to look ahead. We can see the changes happening and it just seems dumb not to be trying to figure out how to, how to get some headlights on this and see what's going on. So we put together a proposal, uh, it's funded by the Maine Coastal Program through NOAA, and we are actually funded uh, and started work in the fall of 2021. And next slide. The part of that is we did shore access work. So some of it is we just spent time talking with people and mapping. So that, that was where some of that went. But the bulk of the money, really, and effort, I think, went into trying to figure out uh, what's going to happen in the firm named the FD Environmental completed a vulnerability assessment and action plan for us. And I'm going to take, I'm going to pull myself to about maybe 10 minutes. I won't get into this too deep. This plan is available on our website. It, it's downloadable, printable. Uh, it's, it's, there's a link right on the first page of the Willsboro Shore website. Uh, and I'll say more about it, but it's www.willsboroshore.ne. Um, but I wanted to give you a little sense of, of what's it about it, because it, looking at these things without a little sense of how it works it, is difficult. Next slide. So this looks awful, but I, the key thing is, is that Maine in 2020 set some guidelines for communities, and, it's, and the guidelines are sort of binding if communities want to do something and get money from the state, they need to be thinking in terms of doing these things. And one thing is, is to commit to manage for a foot and a half of sea level rise by 2050. It'll actually be a, a lot. Um, and I'll tell you that this work in 2020 is already kind of dated. Uh, that foot and a half is baked in. That's going to happen. Probably be a little bit more than that, but but that is uh, a thirty out thirty years or so. So you know, it's a time where if we get money and we start planning, it's you know I've been here about uh, thirty years. That's not that long, right? So you know it'll get. It's a time to be thinking about it, basically. So, so and then to prepare to manage for about four feet of sea level rise by twenty fifty could happen, and. Um, and particularly for something like Korea Harbor, where it can't tolerate a lot of, where you just don't want to have, you don't want to take chances. So for low risk tolerance, it's a weird word, but it means you, you just don't want to take a chance. Um, so Korea Road, Grand Marsh Bay. And then commit to manage for that, for sure, by 2100, and understand that by 2100, we could be looking at about nine feet. So. And it's just like, wow, but that's probably conservative science right now. So those are the, when we look at these maps, that's where these numbers come from, is just that this is, this is best guesses as to what is most likely to happen or could happen. Next slide. So just to get you a sense of this, this is, I got this map over there, but we can look at this together. So, the light blue areas then are the foot and a half. And that's where, and I, and I should say, this is just sea level rise. So this is a high, this is like, it's a bathtub and it rises. This has got nothing to do with the storm surge or anything like that. Storm surge goes on top of this. So what this means is on a high tide day, 2050, it's very likely that high tide will be about a foot and a half higher 
And that's what this blue is. The darker green is the four-footish thing that could happen by 2050 and most likely will happen by the end of the century. The brown stuff is where you've got floodplain stuff that's intersecting a bit. Um, and then the light green is, is the stuff that, that if we did have, or do have, end up having uh, the 8.8 .8 feet or 9 feet, then these things will be, it's not like they'll be underwater all the time, but when the tide is high and you have a well, full moon and a high tide, these places will see water. So, um, Goldsboro, uh, Korea is where Deputy Environmental found most of the stuff that really needs to be um, looked at, done some engineering work, and really trying to figure out, well, what is it that we can possibly do? Um, if you go to the next slide, this actually gets in a little closer to the harbor. Um, I was talking to some folks at the head of this, they sort of say, well, these, yeah, yeah, these things flood already. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and by the way, that crawling out of the road, periodically, you just have to pile rocks off of it. So that, that happens. Um, and then basically, see, the harbor infrastructure at risk of flooding from um, sea level rise impacts from a hurricane. Um, and, you know, hurricane, again, if, it, if we have a six-foot surge that's on top of the tide, and, and that begins that we actually begin to look at what at these green areas getting wet. So we, this whole area that with, with the hurricane, you know, this is, this is up eight feet. Most of it's um, got water on it. Um, next slide. So the other one that um, is worth looking at, and um, actually most are sort of lucky. I mean, we don't have, for 55 miles of shoreline, we have a few places that we really need to get together as a town, find the money to, to do feasibility studies and engineering work, and try to get something done over the next 20 years. Um, you look at southern Maine, uh, mm -hmm. In places like that, about your man. I mean, the water just runs in because it's it's marsh and uh, it's, it doesn't have the, the high high elevation. Or uh, Rhinelhaven is another one where they're basically looking at losing their, their downtown. So we're actually not in bad shape. Um, so this one is Grand Marsh Bay will reach its ambition to uh, become at one with the prospect garden. But um, so right now, you know, within the near future, these areas already flood. This is the um, private road that is already getting um, water over it. Certainly if we, if Hurricane Lee had not veered east and moved west, we would have seen some of this going on there, just driving water into it. This is Korea Road, and the significant thing here is that Sea level rise will take time. A storm won't. The leak could have come in. And what we would have had conceivably was everybody on Korea not having access to emergency services because all of the emergency services are over here someplace. And so one of the very serious concerns of the town is what do we do to make sure that if there's an emergency, we can still uh, get over to Korea. And this is this is the, the hot spot for that. Um, and it'll be just, you know, it, it isn't, I'm not telling you anything that, that the town isn't already doing the other. So this is something that, that, uh, that we all know that we need to address. So, um, next slide. Uh, we presented all of this last May at a three hour workshop. We had about 70 people there, which was great. This was at the cafeteria at Peninsula School. Um, and um, next slide. We're also the, the, the town's moving on this. I mean, I'm I am so happy to, to be here rather than some other community that is sticking their head in the sand about it. Goldsboro is um, really very progressive on this. So uh, the town has just just last week, two weeks ago, finally gotten. 
uh, accepted into the Community Resilience Partnership Program, which will give the town access to uh, reduced in-kind share on various state-funded grants to do some of the work we're talking about. Uh, the town has uh, created a new Climate Resilience Committee. It's in the works. It's not up and running yet. Um, but it'll, when it is up and running, it, you'll be seeing about it on the Rules Brochure website, because I think we'll be kind of merging that Rules Brochure side into the climate resilience work and calling that. Uh, what the committee will do, the committee won't be deciding, making decisions. The committee will be finding money to bring in the expertise to help guide the town through some of this. So mostly, and I think in terms of the various staff that we've got in the town, they don't have time to be tracking all the proposals and writing proposals. So that'll be, I think, mostly what the committee will be doing. Next slide. Um, our website, rulesbrochure.me, um, as I said earlier, a link to the report is on the front page of the, of the site. Next slide. Um, we're working on a, a booklet that we'll probably talk a little about it, but we're, we're working on a, on a booklet that will be, I think, available in print before the end of the year. And it really is about this. It's about really recognizing that uh, it's in some ways it's it, it really aimed at people who are coming here. So we have a su su surprising number of people buying property over the internet. <laughs> Um, and the idea is, well, that's great, welcome, but um, do understand that living on the ocean and living by the sea is different, and, and it, it involves different sorts of risks, but also different sorts of responsibilities. And so, so the booklet will we'll talk about that a little bit. I think that's all we had to say. Do we? Yeah, as it's end. I guess we're done. <laughs> of stuff, wander around please, and uh, some of this is what you see, but other than the pictures, one of the nice things about these posters is they talk about um, the action steps and recommendations and things of that nature. Uh, all of that information is, is in that the environmental report. Um, it's just sort of break it down. Anyway. There's also some stuff here. There's uh, a sign-up list if you want to be on our mailing list so that you don't have to remember the URL. We send you information. Um, you can color your own green crab. You have some information on identifying them. And we have, we have a little touching zoo. We have a green crab and a not green crab. Um, and some shellfish stuff, some things, things you can take away if you want. And I should add that the Ghost Brochure, this website that we have, is the town. So it isn't like it's a separate organization. It is the town. I mean, it's the town administers it. It's, it's everything, all the money comes through the town. And, and uh, so it isn't like it's some different thing. It, this is, you know, this is your community. It's, it's and there's actually a link to the Goldsboro Shore website on the home page of or the first page of the town website. If you scroll down to the bottom with yeah. partners and other organizations, we're, the, we're down on there at the bottom. Are there any questions for uh, Bonnie or Bill? Well, we thank you very much for the most interesting talk. I mean, you certainly uh, did a lot of work. This is uh, significant. Okay. Thank you. As Bill was saying, it doesn't seem like 30 years is that far away. I've done this bizarre calculation. Oh, thank you very much. This bizarre calculation, and I'm 79 years old. And so there's as much distance between when I was born and where I am now is if you go back to World War II to 1944 and go back 80 years, you're the Civil War. So somehow I expected a lot of things to change between the Civil War and World War II, but I didn't expect them to change so much at the time that I was alive. But they yeah. have. And we've only lived here 20 years. Um, and it, it's gone by very quickly. And you think another 20 years, you know, as Bill said, the changes he's seen. So, you know, we're making history. 